Domestic violence doesn't just affect the victim, who is often female. It also affects others, such as children and families involved in the situation. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. In today's episode, my guest, Patricia Castillo, and I will talk about the negative impact of domestic violence, the challenges that stem from poverty, and being a survivor after such a traumatic experience. Patricia Castillo is a domestic violence advocate and co-founder of the Peace Initiative. Peace is an acronym for putting an end to abuse through community efforts. Enjoy our conversation. And most of all, be a, a support to those who are victims of domestic violence. It is Women's History Month, and this month, the Empowerment Zone is featuring Latinas who are making an impact in our communities and empowering our communities all across this nation and world. And today we have Patricia Castillo, who is executive director of the Peace Initiative out of San Antonio, Texas, which is one of my favorite cities of all time. <laughs> my, I actually have roots in Texas with, I mean, roots in San Antonio with my uh, grandfather uh, having uh, become of age in San Antonio, and he was also very good friends with Henry B. Gonzalez Sr. And ladies, we are here uh, to uh, talk about domestic violence. And it's not just for ladies, it's for the men too. And as you know, ladies, we all want to reach our fullest potential. And the only way we do that is if we free ourselves and our communities from the domestic violence. And as all of you listeners know, uh, the Empowerment Zone has featured several episodes about uh, domestic violence. And for those of you who are interested, you can check out Dr. Valencia Sylvain's episode and also uh, Krista McGowan and Celine Alexandria's episode. Uh, be, they, those two were together on one episode because they talked uh, about how uh, domestic violence touches young people too. They were college students. And mm -hmm. so that was informative for me. Uh, but today we have Patricia here and I'm so glad to have you. Patricia, welcome to the Empowerment Zone. I'm so happy to be here, Ramona. And thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, well, um, so uh, domestic violence is your topic today, but can you tell us a little bit about your background and yourself? Are you from San Antonio originally? Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I am born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I never have lived anywhere else in my <laughs> whole life. Why should you? <laughs> Why should I? <laughs> You know, when I was young, I used to like kind of beat myself up about that because everybody was always telling me, oh, you need to go, you know, learn about new places and you need to move on and you need. And I was like, but I don't want to. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm dedicated to this city. And so I love San Antonio. I'm born and raised here. I was raised in the barrio. Um, I did have a couple of years, a few years when my dad was assigned to work in other cities. So we lived in Nacogdoches, Texas for a couple of years. And we also lived in Nixon, Texas for a couple of years. And so I had good experiences in those little towns, but I also had bad experiences in those little towns. Um, and dealing with issues of racism and things like that, right? Um, but San Antonio is my heart and soul, and um, I've dedicated to doing this work um, for San Antonio and for the familias of San Antonio and the women and girls of San Antonio. And, and most recently, you know, I dedicated also an, a part of my life to, you know, working with men. We have to work with men. And, and so um, I, I, uh, I love that I'm from the barrio. Um, but I have lived in other parts of San Antonio, and um, now I'm 
I'm stuck here in my little far west side house and and uh, um, I'm doing my work from here and uh, San Antonio is uh, a challenge you know to to live in as well as to work in because while we have this reputation of being a very beautiful tourist city uh, probably about 50 percent of our families live below the poverty line mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of poverty here that are people we hide it well we hide it well and um, and and that part of our identity also poses a tremendous challenge to addressing domestic violence, right? Uh, not that it's a cause of domestic violence, but it makes it much harder for a survivor to come out of domestic violence when they're surrounded by poverty. And, you know, a lot of people don't know those stats about uh, San Antonio, you know, with uh, so many of its population living below the poverty line and how that magnifies uh, the challenges that we have with domestic violence. So tell mm -hmm. me, what made you get into domestic violence? Why are you so passionate about it? And what made you found an organization such as Peace? You know, what happened, uh, Ramona, was honestly, I, you know, I, I didn't really choose social work. Um, I was one of those kids that I was going to go in the military to get out of my parents' hair because I was kind of a troubled kid. And I, I, you know, I brought a lot of heartache to my parents when I was growing up. Um, and, and that stems from the fact that I was a survivor of child sexual abuse, but I never made those, all those connections, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. early on. Um, and so I was a troubled child. I did have trouble in school and, and, um, and I was a little juvenile delinquent and, um, you know, I, I, I had to overcome all of those experiences. But when I told my dad, you know, we were talking about what I was going to do uh, as an adult, you know, he said, well, I already have you all signed up to go to Our Lady of the Lake University. And I was like, what? And he, he said, yeah, you're going to go to Our Lady of the Lake University. I'm like, dad, we can't afford that. That's a private Catholic college. You know, that's a private university. I can't go there. And he goes, yes, that's where you're going. And I said, no, dad, no, I'm, I have other plans. And he was like, no, you don't. This is your plan. You're going to the university and that's all I want to hear about it. And he was just like adamant. He had been applying for financial aid for me behind my back when I was in high school and I didn't know. And I was meeting with recruiters from the army behind his back and <laughs> You know, because that's what I was going to do was I was going to go see the world traveling and, and you know, being in the military because I come from a military family. I have lots of members of the military and my fam veterans in my family. And so to me, it's, it seemed like a right fit, you know. And so that's what I was going to do. But he was just, you know, he put his foot down and I was one signature away mm -hmm. from going in the army. And he stopped me. Um, and he said, you're going to the university. And I'm, and so I went and I didn't have really like a goal or a profession or a career in mind. I was like, I'm going to go get this degree to shut my father up. And that way he'll leave me alone, you know? And that was my plan. But I ended up in social work because I liked people. I like, you know, being around people, working with people, talking with people, relating to people. And um, so I ended up with a bachelor's degree and that put me um, out there in the field to, to learn about domestic violence. But in my practicum, I had exposure to the battered women's shelter. And that shocked me to my core because I had no idea that we needed a place for women to go to that were getting beat up by their husbands and partners. And it was like, a, a rude awakening for me because we didn't even that was in the 70s you know that we didn't even talk about it in in college I mean I think we might have read like a paragraph in in one book about family violence in the 70s the 1970s and so um it was shocking to me that and I went to the shelter and that was it Ramona I was hooked I met all these women that worked there most of them were survivors that had come out of situations of abuse. 
And, you know, I was just in awe of them. I was really in awe of them. And, um, but at the same time that I was in awe, I was terrified because I thought, how painful must it be to face this issue every day? And, and so I, you know, the women there, after I met them and stuff, they stayed in contact with me and I stayed in contact with them. And they were like, we need you to come work with us. When are you graduating? We need you to come work with us. And I was like, no, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> I was like, stay away from me. <laughs> and so, you know, I did run from it, but I ended up taking a job that seemed um, like no big deal, right? But it was my first job out of college doing work at the Bear County Women's Bar Foundation Law Clinic. And they asked me, can we hire you to recruit lawyers to provide legal advice to our members and uh, write a newsletter? And I said, sure, that's what I'll do. But what happened was that every time we had clinic, our waiting room would get filled with battered women mm. and their kids. And so one day after I'd been there a while, the other staff they were not like, you know, they, it was a secretary and a receptionist, you know, and uh, the receptionist was like the part-time janitor, right? And so, you know, the room was filled with all these battered women. Half of them were falling apart, crying. And I was sitting at my desk in my office and the secretary comes in, the, the secretary comes in and says, hey, don't you have some kind of a degree? And I said, <laughs> uh, yes. And she was like, but you need to come help us. These women out here are falling apart and we don't know what to say to them. You know, you're, you have a degree, get out there and do something. And I was like, okay, you know. <laughs> and there I went, I mean, like from the frying pan into the fire, you know, and that's how my work got started. Isn't that something, um, you know, just speaking about the influence of family, <laughs> father knows best, you know. <laughs> I preach and, and, about my dad every day now. Oh my God. Yes, and we as children, we always say, "Oh, our parents don't know what they're talking about." You know, we we kind of, uh, you know, they, they they don't know anything. But yet, yeah. your father was there making a way. And I've always said, no matter who you are, African American, Latino. Uh, LGBTQI plus, all people want the best for their children. They want yes. them to do better than what they have done. And they sacrifice their lives so that, so that the next generation can be better. And here exactly. we are, your father is right there in the trenches, not telling you, but I'm paving the way for you. And that's an incredible uh, story. You know, you yeah. going into the field of social work is, is really special to me and my family because my mother is a social worker. And oh, wow. Have, and used to work for um, the uh, the uh, state uh, school uh, for juvenile delinquents. And one of the things she always taught us in terms of parenting is that many of the children who were juvenile delinquents, she said, is because they experienced some kind of trauma. And most mm -hmm. people don't acknowledge that trauma or try to heal them. And so here you exactly. are having experienced that, but at, uh, at least you had a great father who pushed you in uh, the right direction. And talking sure about did. Fry, frying pan to the fire, I mean, you had to go out there and serve, not having any type of uh, map or anything, but go out there and figure out a solution to the problem. Um, I'm, you know, when you look at you working for this law law firm, correct, and then going into the uh, working for peace. Tell us what does peace stand for, and okay. what is the mission of your organization? What do you do regarding domestic violence, and how are you different from all of those other organizations that exist? Okay, um, you know, uh, you know. When I ended up in the in the in the fire, that was in 1980, right? Mm -hmm. And I established and and I worked with a woman named Jane Schaefer. She was my my you know, my comrade in action. Um, she and I founded the Peace Initiative, and Peace is an acronym that stands for putting an end to abuse through community efforts. Mm -hmm. And Ramona, the reason why we picked that name was because. 
when we were beginning, when I got hired by the Benedictine sisters in 1990 to go work for them, they, they took me out of the Bear County jail, right? Cause I was, I wasn't detained or locked up. Okay. I was working a program in there called mothers and their children. And that stood for match, right? Match the match program, mothers and their children. And, um, I was working in there and the, the Catholic chaplain was a, um, a, relig a woman religious, a nun uh, who worked for the Benedictine sisters. And she said, you know, we're, we wanna hire a lay person to come and work for the Benedictine sisters and be like our community representative. And we'll pay you and we'll fund your position but you're representing us. You're going to be like our community arm out in, in with working with people in the community. And this group is a very small group. I think there might be less than 20 nuns left in this order. And uh, because they're all elderly now, right? And so I went to go work for the Benedictine sisters. She invited me to come work for them. And, um, but they gave me no job description. They didn't, they never told me what I was supposed to do. The only thing they told me was, we want you to go work in the community and we want you to develop programming that benefits the lives of women and children. That's all they said. They didn't tell me what to do. They didn't ask me what I want. They just said, that's what you're gonna do. And I was like, you know, I was coming from the jail, right? Working in the jail where everything is structured. Everything is to check off the box. Everything is got a rule and a policy. And, you know, it was so, you know, regimented. I mean, like even when you got in the elevator, you would tell somebody in a camera, floor three, <laughs> and they would take you, you know? And so um, you couldn't even push a button in the elevator, right? And so um, to then be put into this position of, create something, you know, make something out of this. And so I decided to just go to the community. I had some background, you know, my second job after the law center was as a community organizer in the African-American community. And I got trained by some of the best industrial areas foundation organizers. And, um, and so I fell back on my community organizing roots, right? And so I went to the community and asked them what should, you know, we have this opportunity supported by the Benedictine sisters. What do we need to be doing? Where should we need to be going with this work? How can we benefit the lives of women and children? And in talking to all these battered women and all these people that work, serve the community that are representative of agencies, the main topic that kept coming up over and over and over again was what's happening to families, what's happening to women and families, how much domestic violence there is, how the cops don't do anything to help them. They, they re-victimize them. They you know, um, aren't trained. They don't know what the laws are. Um, I mean, just all of these things was what we were finding out from you know, meeting with all these people. We spent like the first six months just meeting with all these people, gathering information, doing power analysis, you know, all of this stuff, right? And um, it just kept coming back to domestic violence and the poor role of law enforcement intervention. Nobody was helping these victims. And this is the same information that we gathered at the law clinic with the Women's Bar Foundation, right? And so these women were coming in to get legal advice and it was always about their rights, about being beat up, about, you know, what could they do to help themselves? How, you know, what about the children? I mean, all of those things around domestic violence. And so, um, but one of the things that was also very um, striking was when we asked battered women what they wanted from us, what we could do for them, you know, I was expecting them to say, I need my child support. I need my, you know, uh, spousal support. I need, you know, a lawyer. I need a divorce. I need, you know what they told us? They said, we want to live in peace. Hmm. Can you help us live in peace? <laughs> That's what we want. We want to live in a peaceful neighborhood. We want our kids to know peace. We want our relationship to be a peaceful relationship. Can you help us get that? And I'm like, oh my God, where do you get that? 
you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you achieve that? You know, I mean, I can get you a free lawyer. I can get you a divorce. <laughs> I can get you your child support. I can, you know what I'm saying? Because but it's so subjective, you, right? Yes, yes. But where do you go get peace? And I was like, oh Lord, you know? And so we just, we stayed with it. We stayed with it and and we used the word peace as our acronym. And then, uh, you know, putting an end to abuse. That's what these women were asking for. We don't want to live like this. This is not the way it's supposed to be, you know? And then engaging the community. It had to be about community involvement, community efforts, community recognition, you know, Community, the community has to resolve this, the community, right? It always has to go back to community because we're the savior, you know, nobody else is going to save us. And the vast majority of women that I've worked with, like over the, you know, all these years, 43 years, most of the time they themselves get themselves out of those situations, right? I mean, bottom line, that's, that's who's going to do the work you know, the survivor themselves, you know, and so we have to recognize that. So how does a community create an environment for that person to be able to help themselves, to reclaim their personal power, you know, that's been usurped by this, you know, person who uses violence against them. So can you expand mm -hmm. upon that? Because a lot of times we look at ending domestic violence as an individual issue and not as a collective issue. And we know that African-Americans and Latinos are a communal people and yeah. that community is the foundation of who we are and what we do. So what are the solutions that you saw in terms of community engagement and community uh, being involved in solving this this issue of domestic violence? One of the things that we took on first and foremost was educating law enforcement so that they would quit acting so horrible when responding to domestic violence. And so, you know, we had to go over there and get our foot into the training academy. And so we, you know, elbowed our way in there. You know, nobody invited us nobody asked us to come do this we just said you know we think this would be helpful for y'all you know <laughs> and so we we were able to do two years of training in the police academy we were in there every week training officers you know from the brass all the way to the foot officer right and so we did that for the first two years at the same time we were also exploring other programs across the country that were looking at getting community involved. The program we went to go check out that we liked, that everybody liked, was a program out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. But they called it DART, Domestic Abuse Response Teams. And they had a model where the volunteer, the citizen volunteer, would be recruited, screened, trained, and given a car, a city car, and a police radio. And when an officer would end up responding to a domestic violence call, they'd send for the volunteer. They'd clear it up. They would make sure that everything was safe, that the person using violence was removed and away from there. And then they would invite the volunteer to come work with the victim because it's a very small window of opportunity, like right after the episode of violence, where you can really get to the, the survivor to realize this is a bad situation. You really need some help because sometimes if you wait till the morning to call them, they're like, oh, no, it's OK. He's better now. He already said he apologized and he said he's going to do better. And, you know, don't worry. Um, thanks for checking on me, but you don't have to call me anymore. OK, bye. And so you've lost them. Right. You've lost the opportunity to work with them because they've already been, con they're trying to make it work. You know, that's a, an American value, right? And in our culture, even more so, you know, especially like if you're married in the church and, you know, all of these things that affect how we think, right? As Latinos, as Mexico-Americanos, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? And so um, you need to get to them right afterwards. And so we were, we thought, man, this would be awesome. So we created a program like that 
We replicated that model for San Antonio, but we called it FACT, Family Assistance Crisis Teams. And um, that's how we started screening, recruiting, training citizen volunteers. Um, we did that from 1990 all the way to 2020 when the pandemic hit. And we provided those trainings four times a year. And uh, so we did them quarterly and we did them at the police academy. And we, um, the, the smallest group we ever had was seven. And the largest groups we ever had of volunteers were like in between 40 and 50 people. People always volunteered to participate in that program. So that helped us because of that, we were able to, to educate something like 3000 fact volunteers in those years, right? Which was what? 20 years or something, how many years is that? Mm -hmm. Anyways, and so the other idea of that is now you have an informed, educated citizenry that's embedded in the community, right? Because you need to have your citizenry aware. Otherwise, you know, you have people giving off bad information. Um, we, we learned real quickly that so many victims they don't call the police, like probably more than 90% of victims, they don't call the police. They don't see the police as helpful. They don't see the police as productive. They, they don't trust them. So they don't call them. Um, you know, so, I, so I, what I, was the solution since, you know, police, many, let's talk about the 90% that don't call the police. Right. How did you get in, get uh, your uh, sit in street? involved in the issues if they didn't call the police? Well, not all of them do that. There are still people who do call the police, you know, and unfortunately they wait until it's so bad, you know, that your, your life is being threatened, you know, like you're being strangled. Uh, somebody is using a weapon against you. You know, it has escalated. So to the point where it's so bad that, your kids grow up in it and they call the police while you're in the other room getting beat up. Your children send for the cops, right? Uh, or the neighbors call the police, right? Because they can hear it. They know what's going on. They can hear it. And so they send the cops, right? And so in those cases where the cops do get involved, we wanted our volunteers to be working alongside those officers so that the officers would have some you know, some backup, some palanca, right? That they could lean on, not just themselves because the officers, they're not, they don't want to do that aspect of the work. They want, you know, they want to just, just the facts, ma'am, you know, and write a report, vamos, let's go, right? And, and that way they have this backup that can say, ma'am, can I talk to you over here? Uh, come sit over here with me, let's talk, you know? And then, you know, that part of the work gets done while the officer is over here dealing with, the criminal aspect of it, right? And so, um, it took us a while to get um, our police chief to finally allow the volunteers to ride with the officers to those calls. Um, we had to go through, I think, three police chiefs before they would allow the, the, the volunteers to ride in the car. The other ones would always say it's a liability, it's a liability, it's a liability, you know, and honestly, I, I thought, you know, it's not a liability, you just don't want to let us do that, you know, um, and because when we finally got to this police chief that we have right now, and he's the one that let us get in the cars, he was like, it's a liability walking out your house, you know, <laughs> exactly, exactly, <laughs> you know, and he was like, yeah, I think that's good. Let's put them in the cars with the officers. And that way they get to talk with each other. You know, he saw it as a community building, exactly. a relationship exactly. building opportunity, you know, and so again, that's another aspect of the work, right, that the citizens get to know their police department and their officers, you know, and the, a, a lot of the volunteers that worked in the program also felt like this is a, um, you know, a, an opportunity for me to take care of my neighborhood. This is my neighborhood. This is my police substation. I want to contribute to that effort, right? A lot of our volunteers are also, Ramona, survivors, you know, former 
victims, former, you know, people that came out of those situations. A lot of men who volunteered in our program watched their mothers get beat up and wanted to now do something to help people get out of those situations. And so um, then what we found was that these volunteers were helping people outside of the program because we would only ask them to donate one eight hour um, segment of time per month. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some did more and, and others just stuck with their one eight hour, you know, shift. And, um, but then they'd call us during the week and say, Hey, I was just talking to this lady at the school where I work, she's getting beat up and I was guiding her and I told her what to do. And, and I'm like, write that up. That's mm -hmm. a service that you've provided to your community. You know, that has value, write it up, document it and send it to us. And so they were all doing that too. And so that was another way that that whole piece about now we have educated, informed people embedded in the community and guess what they're doing? Yeah, they're know? continuing to do that work. Yes. So, yes. so when you talk, you know, you talked about earlier about, you know, domestic violence being a silent disease, really. Mm -hmm. And a Secret. lot of people suffer from domestic violence beyond just the poor. You know, we have educated okay. professional women who are silently Absolutely. suffering. So uh, my final question for you today is what can we do individually and collectively, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of addressing domestic violence uh, in our individual families and in our communities? What calls to action? What strategies would you suggest for people who want to rid themselves of, so, of domestic violence or want to help someone else? Well, um, first of all, educate yourself, right? Learn about it, uh, understand the impact of it because every social problem we have in our communities, Ramona, has its roots in domestic violence. Trauma, trauma. Everybody who is addicted to drugs, everybody who's in and out of jail, everybody who's, you know, alcoholic or, you know, everybody who's dealing with all this stuff as an adult, it usually stems from coming from households and families where they experienced a lot of chronic violence, okay? Another thing, stop hitting our children. We have to abandon physical corporal punishment against our children. It is devastating to children's lives. And that was one of the things that I was dealing with growing up because our parents they used to beat the hell out of us. They thought they were doing the right thing, but they didn't. They were ignorant and they didn't know how much damage it was doing to the children. So we have to stop that. One of the things that San Antonio does is we provide um, free parenting classes in English and Spanish all over the city. Um, and uh, we use a curriculum called Triple P because it's evidence-based to work. And so we do, we have funding to do that for free for anybody and everybody. Um, most of the people we serve are referred to us from the child protective services system because those families have a lot of violence. They come from violence, right? Um, another thing you can do is don't judge victims because you don't know what they're doing, what, what they're going through. You don't know what their life is like. You can't judge them until you've been there you don't know what it's like. Um, another thing you can do is never tell a survivor, you need to leave, you need to get out. You need to abandon that relationship because it, you don't have a right to tell somebody what to do with their life. And when you're telling somebody to leave, that part of the relationship when they're trying to end it is the most dangerous time. That's when most victims end up dead, okay? And because your chances of being murdered or severely injured, shoot up 75%. So if, if you wanna help somebody who's trying to get away from a situation like that, say something like, how can I help you? Let's develop a safety plan. What, would, what can I do that would be of help to you? Um, you tell me, you know this person better than anybody else. What, how is this person gonna react? And so how can we avoid 
being the victims of that reaction. You know what I'm saying? Non-judgmental, open-ended, loving questions. Uh, don't put down their abuser because that'll make them want to defend their abuser because they picked that person. That's their spouse. And so if you're going to, you know, start, you know, what a jerk and it, that's not helpful. Say, um, I want to help you because I love you. Uh, I want to, I want to be there for you. Call me anytime. This is my cell. Call me anytime. Can I accompany you to go press charges? Can I go with you to check out what it might look like to go to the shelter? Can I you take care of the kids while you go file for a protective order? You know, those kinds of things are helpful to somebody. Um, but remember that they're the expert in their life. Listen to them. We have to listen to them. That's providing trauma-informed care. Okay, be compassionate, not judgmental. And um, ask your pastor to preach from the pulpit about domestic violence. Um, they have a lot of power. They have a lot of ways to, to influence their congregation. Um, we just did a big event yesterday here in San Antonio uh, to engage the faith community. We had a hundred people show up, a hundred some of them, some of them were pastors, but many of them were church leadership, right? Um, and so we need to do that kind of work. And this kind of work has to happen in every institution, the media, the schools, the churches, the healthcare system, the, you know, recognize that every institution in your community has a role to play. have now uh, come to our segment on strategies for college success. I am a big advocate for higher education. And um, I always ask my guests, what strategy would you give students to ensure that they are successful in college? And before you answer that question, could you please tell us what college or colleges did you attend? What were your majors? and degree or degrees? And then what is your strategy for college success? Well, I'm a graduate of Our Lady of the Lake University. Um, and I might say a very proud graduate. Um, I got my ma uh, bachelor's degree in social work, a BSW in 1980. And then I um, received a fellowship in 1985 to, um, get my master's degree in social work. And I was able to finish that in 11 months because wow. I quit work and I focused solely on, um, you know, school work. I got, uh, uh, the fellowship was $7,000 and I got a $6,000 loan and to live off of. And um, my friend provided me a place to live rent free. Mm -hmm. And I, stuck with it. I just, you know, I did it in 11 months. Uh, and the first time it was a little harder because like I told you, um, I was resistant to it because my father made me go. But now I, I preach about how my father saved my life by making me go. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think it's very important to surround yourself with people that are like-minded and value education. I think uh, if you do come from a background of woundedness, like I did, I came from a background of physical violence from the discipline my parents inflicted on us, as well as sexual abuse from a family member. Uh, I got myself into therapy while I was in undergraduate school. And that was the best thing I ever could have done for myself. It opened the door to healing. It opened the door to uh, strengthening my relationship with my parents. It opened the door to allowing me to, to um, think about myself as a sober person because I was drinking a lot also in undergraduate school, but I was able to eventually become a sober person. Um, and um, it was the best thing I ever did. And then every time I would run into a wall I would get myself back in therapy because I'm worth it. I'm worth the investment of getting healed and living a sober life and being able to um, focus on my job, on my career, on my community challenges. 
and do it in a way where my, my mind, my spirit, my heart, everything is open. And I see my relationships with people, especially my family, as sacred. And I value them and treat them that way. And so do those things for yourself. Take care of yourself. You're worth it. And you deserve to be healed. And if we don't get healed, then those wounds will impact every aspect of your work, no matter what you go into. So those, those are my recommendations. Man, Patricia, those are great recommendations. And uh, um, surround yourself with affirming people who value education and seek help. Get therapy when you need it. I have never heard uh, that particular recommendation. And you explained it so well of why therapy is important. It's, yes. it's important to the healing process. Uh, important for you to uh, begin the forgiveness process, yes. developing self-respect and self-confidence, and also restoring relationships. Therapy yes. is so important, and it also helped you because you were able to get all that weight off of you to be able to really reach your Gone. potential. Yep, yep, Gone. yep. And and it, what you didn't engage in self-destructive behavior anymore because you were were healed. Thank you so much for that great advice. Uh, and thank you for being a guest on the Empowerment Zone. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry Ann Gully, theme song. NADWorks, digital support. And of course, our featured guest, 